Uh, you already got my elaborate introduction to these two gentlemen. I'm just going to say that uh, it's been a pleasure to work with them. We think we've got exactly the right team to help us uh, go forward with this project. Okay, uh, we have the board members sitting up here at the table. Uh, the way we've structured the agenda today is it has three major parts. The first part is an update of the conceptual designs relative to this building, the community center. Now that was the focus of the workshop. So for those of you who are not at the workshop, we had a very good discussion of preliminary designs and a lot of comments from the people in the audience. And the majority of those comments got rolled into a revised design, which uh, Terry and Gray will be uh, uh, explaining to you today. So I'll be the first item on the agenda. Uh, there will be an opportunity for you to comment at that time. So let's talk about comments. We have actually three ways that you can uh, provide comments or ask questions. One way is there are uh, three by five cards that are on the table. If you didn't get one and you want one, just raise your hand and uh, Alyssa will bring you one. Also, when you're finished filling out your question, just raise the card and Alyssa will pick it up from you and, and get it to me. So that's the first way. We know there's some folks that are uh, a bit on the shy side, but they still want to get their uh, question asked or they want to get their comment made. The second way you can uh, make comments is we have in the uh, dance floor over here a series of drawings that you'll be seeing on the screen. And after we talk about the community center and then talk about the apartment facility, we'll have a break where you can go in and look at those and refresh your memory about what you saw on the screen. And we have post-its in there that you can write comments and just stick them right on the drawing. So if you have a, you know, a thing about, uh, you know, why is this entry here, or did you think about X or Y or Z, put on the post-it, put on the drawing. So what happens to all those? Well, actually what happens is uh, we capture all the comments and questions when the questions are answered, we get them on both the question and the answer. And then we have all the uh, general comments, comments about design, comments from the post-its, comments from the cards, and all those uh, get um, um, captured and go to the uh, board of directors so that they don't have to remember what someone said at the meeting. It's all here. Okay, uh, a couple more things about the process. As you all know, we're in the conceptual design part of this process. Um, and what that means is we're trying to figure out what should we do? What should we do? Once the board wrestles with this, and I believe that this will have a couple more iterations of us looking at these options. Once the board does that and decides they want to do X, Y, or Z, then uh, Terry and, and Greg will start helping us with how would you do that? And at that point, they start looking at things like where do we get the utilities? How do we design the parking lots? What kind of grading issues do we have? And so it's a, it's a uh, um, further step to refine whatever we decide we want to do at a conceptual level. Also at that stage, we have the process of giving the members an opportunity to see what the buildings might look like. So we start to see elevations. We start to see interior design treatments. We start to see various kinds of finishes that uh, are available that we could do. That's where we start to make the decision of what's an appropriate building for our specific community. Many of the buildings in this brochure are designed for very high-end uh, resort-type communities. But these folks have done community buildings for all kinds of neighborhoods and communities. And so they can design in the entire range of uh, quality levels, functionality. So that would be the second step, the preliminary design step. The other thing that uh, I want to mention is there's a third way to comment. Uh, when we experimented with comments at the workshop, um, I thought the cards were a great idea. Then you don't have replication and uh, a little bit smaller uh, soapbox for someone to stand on and you know get their latest theory about uh, conspiracies that are striking the nation. But it didn't work. People wanted to talk anyway, so we're going to do that too. So what we got is uh, a, a rather dangerous situation. Um, uh, we gave the mic to Wayne Clark. <laughs> the part of the agenda where members can make 
comments. Uh, you're probably going to have to wrestle that thing away from him so you can use it. But if you'll raise your hand when we get to that stage, I think Wayne is on his best, best behavior to actually give you the mic so you can speak and the other people can hear because that was a problem last time. Um, what else? I talked about the uh, children's programs. Um, oh, uh, communications in general. Okay, so a lot of you have been asking us for uh, expanded communications. And so we've been listening and gradually making changes in how we're uh, doing this, uh, hopefully for the better. Uh, our forum that we had on June the 20th, we actually uh, videotaped, and we have a gentleman here videotaping today's meeting. Uh, those get uploaded uh, four or five days after the meeting onto YouTube. Uh, I believe there's a link at the bottom of the uh, back page of the agenda. So if you want to go look at that, Gee, I, I just wanted to remember, you know, I want to see those uh, three ladies wrestling Wayne for the microphone. You go back and see that uh, on the YouTube. Um, the other thing uh, we did is that we have uh, created a um, Facebook site, uh, a Facebook account, and a lot of this material that you're seeing here, the uh, answers to these questions, uh, some of the material related to what the options are and the trade-offs of those options. Uh, after today's meeting, we'll be putting some material up there about financing of the projects. And so all that stuff, as it becomes available, goes onto the web, uh, Facebook site. Uh, one of the reasons we did that is because you can actually comment uh, on that site. Uh, so that's another place where we can get feedback from the folks. And so uh, please use that. Uh, we do monitor that. We do give those comments uh, to the board. So they do uh, get to the board of directors. I think that's about it. I want to talk about a couple of agenda changes and, and give you a little bit better idea of how the meeting's going to uh, proceed. Uh, so we're going to focus initially on the community center. You've already seen this, two-thirds of you. So what we're doing basically is talking about what are the revisions that were made based on the workshop uh, input. Uh, then we'll have comments about that. Uh, and then we're going to go on to the partner facility concept, and there's two issues there. One is, what do you do with the site itself, and then what do you do with the building itself? So we'll be talking about both of those, and then we'll have comments on that. But there's two items on the agenda that we are not going to do today, uh, and that's the presentation of the estimates of probable construction costs. And the reason for that is those were only uh, available early this morning. And the board of directors has not really had a chance to look at that. It's very detailed information. There's an actual schedule of every single aspect of construction. And we want the board to take a look at that uh, and get familiar with it before they have to start answering the questions about it. So our good game plan is to present that information to the board at their meeting on uh, July 25th. Uh, and then we'll post all the detail, all that information will get posted up on the Facebook site. Uh, once the board has a chance to take a look at it. So uh, that's a courtesy to them that I think uh, we, we need to extend. Um, when we finish talking about the design thing, then we're going to have an open discussion with the board. They've been over, over here listening to you folks, listening to your comments, listening to Terry and Gray, getting the information, but they haven't really had an opportunity to start talking about it and discussing it. And we want to do that today. So they're going to have a discussion. We'll do it similar to what we do in the board meetings. They'll have an opportunity to talk first, uh, their impressions, their ideas, their concepts, and then we'll have a question and answer from the audience. So what I'm asking of you is, if you have questions about the uh, execution of the project or the appropriateness of the project or anything else, wait until that part of the agenda, if you would, please. It's, it's really not fair to Terry and Greg, who are really designing things for us, to try to answer your questions about, uh, uh, well, I understand that this is going to cost X million dollars and we can't afford it. And, and that's a really important comment, but it really belongs to the board, not to Terry and, and Greg. So that's how we'll try to do that. However, I do want to mention one thing before we get started. Uh, at the board meeting on Thursday night, we had a member come forward and say, you know, I've been hearing a lot of comments about what this is going to cost. And I heard that there was going to be a special assessment and every single property was going to have to pay $4,000 for this project. 
And uh, Director Kaminsky said, that's good news. The last lesson I heard was $8,000. <laughs> so uh, a lot of information is floating around, as you know. And I'm going to be talking about financing later in the meeting, with just as we get started with the board discussion. However, I want to put one thing out there so you can just calm down and have fun with the project. By state law and the CCMRs, the board is only authorized to make a special assessment of 5% of the aggregate budget. Okay? So what that means is this. The board in and of itself cannot assess you any more than $120. That's it. That's not per month. That's per year. One-time assessment, $120. That's the maximum they can do. So, does that mean we won't do a special assessment for the project? Well, we certainly won't do that because it only raises $400,000, which is not going to be adequate. But if we did want to raise more than $40,000, it can only be done if the members approve it in a vote. And not only that, at least 50% of the eligible voters have to vote. So it's a very high quality. So if you're hearing people saying that you're going to get a special assessment of $4,000 or $8,000, I got to tell you, you won't unless you vote for it. Okay, so let's get that clear so we don't have to talk about that. Um, the other thing later on, I'll be talking a little bit about other financial things, but let's turn it over to Terry and Greg. Uh, Terry Green, Greg Cornello. I always worried about pronouncing Green correctly. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Um, Good morning to everybody. Uh, this has been a great process and we love our journey here and we like being in front of you. We like this community a lot. We're, we feel very honored to have been selected as the architect to help you, you uh, plan this community um, in this future of facilities. It's uh, got great problems to it and there's lots of potential to it as you'll see from our presentation, especially when we get to the golf house. It's something that uh, in all the years I've been designing the houses, I've got an opportunity to do something here that I've never done before, and I'll, I'll get into that in a bit. Um, so what you see here on the wall, or on the screen here, is um, is our latest uh, iteration on this conceptual plan. And, and again, to reiterate what Bill said, again, we're very, uh, this is very early on in the process, and thank you for all coming and giving us input to this, because this is what shapes the building. Back to get from you today and through your um, community outreach on the website. So uh, we brought back this plan and we wanted to, um, we condensed it down to one design. Last time we had two, and we think this embodies the input that we received last time. Uh, what you see here is this is uh, two floors of the building that we're sitting in right now. Um, we're in this room right here, actually on this level. So this top drawing here is the second level. The lower drawing is the, is the lower, is the first level of the building. Um, the parking lot is over here. The pool is in this location. So just to get oriented correctly. So on the lower level, it's, it's a lot of what we showed last time. There was not a lot of changes made here. Um, basically, we have a single entry um, for daily operations, which embodies the current lobby space, but we've reconfigured the stairs so it doesn't take the whole space up in the middle. And we've opened it up a little more for some seating and kind of a reception area for the uh, staff to greet people to control access to the pool. Um, there's uh, some uh, back office space to support this reception area. And, um, and then behind it, there's some space we can capture where the current mechanical system is to come and put some storage in and relocate the mechanical underneath the building in location number six. Um, then there's some additional pool storage here, but, but what we've done is taken uh, the gap that was between the building here and we've kind of took this whole space and made it into one combined locker room, shower, 
bathroom facility that's primarily there to support the, the pool. The pool um, size of the swimming pool generates the number of uh, showers and toilets that are required for the project. And not only that, it also supports the building um, of uh, toilet facilities on the lower level that people will be using for the office, office areas as well. So um, that's accessible from the pool, and this facility doesn't have to be open to have these doors open. So the people that are coming there through car key and want to do lap swimming, they can have access to this locker room facility without going through the main entry. Um, you've added a snack bar here, and this snack bar can be um, accessible from people that are coming up from the lake to want to buy something or from the pool. So it's a little uh, structure that we put right here, and we haven't really gone into programming what kind of things they'd be serving on the snack bar, but the idea would be it would be there to support both the pool function and uh, let's come to people that want to come up from the lake want to buy something. Um, on the second, on, and then yeah, we'll go to the second level. On the second level, um, when you come up that stairway, you land on the bridge that's currently there. And if you go to your right, when you come up that stair, we've, we've, we've increased the size of this bathroom here to meet handicap requirements for restrooms and increase the, the count of, of restrooms to support the second level. And the last time we talked about this space being a community room, kind of a community gathering space, and there didn't seem to be a lot of interest in that, so we've converted it to the fitness facility and put um, some cardio equipment on both sides because the view up there is phenomenal. And if you're going to come and, and spend time on a track, it'll be a great uh, place to be able to look out over the valley or towards the lake. And then in the center of it, there would be um, some weight equipment, some multi uh, weight machine. And the space really works out well. There's a little storage space here and maybe some dumbbells and that kind of thing. But um, you know, our, our interest would be to know what, what, what is the interest of the community here for this kind of space and um, would, it, would it support a small fitness center? Typically, from our experiences, communities of your size, um, there are people that are interested in not paying the gym dues somewhere else and they come here and work out instead. Um, so if you come up this, uh, come up the uh, stairway and make a, make a left, um, you'll, you'll go to a hallway that, that has two storage areas. Uh, for the whole building and then you can enter um, a community room here. There's um, let's see, there's, there's 48 seats in this space and we've got 32 um, in this space but there, the idea would be is there be a partition system that we try to design with these column structures that we can actually separate this into two rooms that then have the flexibility to open that partition and use it as one space. So this becomes a very flexible space. Um, as you come down this hallway, we've introduced a, um, a kind of a catering or culinary kitchen where there could be um, nutritional classes taught there, uh, culinary class, um, possibly uh, it could also be going to be used to support these facilities for any kind of groups that want to come and do a potluck or that kind of thing. They can use this kitchen as a prep kitchen. Um, and then that, that can open up into this uh, room here. So if there is a nutrition class and there is a lot of interest in that, there could be uh, this space here could be used for seating, um, arts and crafts. The, the uh, tables could go away and you can continue to use it for dance classes. So it's kind of meant to be a multi-use uh, space and very flexible. The, um, the team center is still located at the end here. It has its own separate access, but it's also connected to a community game room where you can have uh, uh, card tables in there, uh, pool tables. We're showing the shuffleboard. It could be air hockey, whatever type of uh, uh, gaming. Uh, type functions you want to want to have in there. We think the space is sufficient. We like the we like the location because it's accessible from this hallway. It's, it's accessible from the outside. And it's also accessible from the team center, so everybody has access to the space. Let's see. Yeah, 
you want to go ahead and get some. Terry, when you, when you address uh, access to the pool, uh, either through the uh, entry when we're in the height of the season or off season or off hours access? Yeah, let, let me go to the site plan to do that. Okay. The, uh, the site plan is uh, a, a very similar to what you saw last time, um, but just to go through it with the people who were here last explain to you, what's here in gold is the current facility. And um, what we've added to it is we've added a drive, kind of a drop-off area in the front, and a couple of handicapped parking stalls, which is necessary at your front door and then uh, made a connection to this drive to the parking parking lot. The uh, pool is in its current configuration. We've added, um, uh, I'll just go through, I'm gonna go through kind of the functions here and I'll show you how to access it. The, uh, there's a, a water, potential for a water slide, kind of a play uh, pool here. Uh, last time there was a comment, um, it would be nice to have a spa and so we've done that here, thinking that there, because the views out for the valley here, it'd be nice to kind of perch that spa over the side of this uh, slope here. Um, we still show uh, some, uh, some solar water heating in this location. Uh, the current uh, pool storage facility is still in this location with the pumps and move the uh, 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 tanks for the uh, gas down the hill to where it's easily um, more serviceable for the road. Um, we've added a new area here. We've taken up some of the parking and reconfigured some of the parking to make it more efficient, but we've added a new area that's connected to the pool with a, a child uh, kind of kids play pool here. It used to be on this side, we moved it over. And also adjacent to that, we put in a um, barbecue area, picnic area, and then we're, we're looking at it also possibly trying to figure out a space to put some bocce courts in because between the bocce courts, the picnic area, and these all functions all work very closely together and support each other. Um, number two uh, is for the possibility that you may want to add a gymnasium in the future that can also be used for all kinds of group exercises and other types of functions. Um, so what we've shown here is a footprint for a full court gymnasium, and it ends up displacing the um, the snack bar. But we would have to figure out, you know, a way maybe making the gym a little deeper or displacing the snack bar into a different location if you ever choose to want to put the gym at, um, as part of this facility. But to answer the question as far as access during the day, or early in the morning or in the evening, if a swimmer has a card. Key, um, there's an access point in, in this location right here. You can get in through this gate into the pool facility without going through the main entry if the, if the building is not in operation at that time. Um, there's a new handicap access on this side to the upper level for the ramp. So that way we can get handicapped on both levels. Yeah, there's about 81, right currently now there's 90, a little over 90 parking stalls that are currently here. And by this, these modifications we've made, it's been reduced down to 81. Um, we did have some discussion about maybe adding some additional parking um, in this area here. Um, there's challenges obviously with tree locations and grades. Uh, but we're, uh, we're feeling that this, uh, this is sufficient parking to support what we have here. Um, I guess we could, build, we could probably go to questions on, on this facility. If we, uh, on the okay, so far I have four cards. Uh, four <laughs> cards coming in. Uh, Melissa, all four of these happen to relate to the Hartman facility, so I'm going to hold those in advance since we're discussing that. Let's see if we have any more cards relative to the community center. <coughs> I 
can you do this one? I can't reach that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to do the cards first today because I, I wanted to encourage the cards. <laughs> my wife working too. <laughs> Actually, Bill, I'll start it off. There's a lady up front here just made a great suggestion. Um, one thing to help in the parking situation is maybe we can show some golf bar parking up here. We take less space up, we can get more in. And we've done that quite a bit. If there's enough acres in easy carts, uh, climbing these hills, we can we can um, easily fit some, some golf bar parking and possibly um, Good spot for that would be maybe along here because the depth is not that much and you can get it, you can get quite a few in there. Oh, yeah, initially, yeah, initially this won't be here, so there's an opportunity to also have more parking for cars in that location as well. Find that somebody's waiting. I'm sorry. Oh. Wow, great. Taco shell will be in front of you. So how many seats, how many people are on the tickets? We So can we get 150 comments, please? <laughs> no. We don't have that long to answer all that. But okay, so definitely want your input. Let's let's get started on these. Uh, some some very good uh, comments. Uh, I know. Some are, are detailed things that we picked up later in the process, but I want to bring them up anyway. Uh, will you keep the shade structures over the kiddie pool and the seating? I don't see the rendering. The answer to that is yes. yes. There will be shade structures. Um, could a parking straight shade structure come a solar panels? Now, we do show solar panels for heating the water of the pool. And Terry and, and Greg both talked about the possibility of uh, photovoltaics being added in a future phase when we do the gymnasium uh, with some sort of shade sh structures. Even though they're not shown here, that's one of the comments that's on the list of things for consideration. Um, Terry, uh, this one's for you. Is there elevator or handicapped access to the second floor? Right there. Well, number nine is the uh, hand, is a handicap ramp on the outside that gets you to the second level. Um, right now, we're not showing an elevator on the plan. Uh, it's about a Eighty to ninety thousand dollar exercise to put one in. Um, if this handicap ramp satisfies the needs, uh, both with the the, the permit uh, processing and the community, then it's a much better solution. Okay, the uh, next one. Um, will you be adding a water fountain for drinking? Yeah. This answer to that is probably yes. Good okay. suggestion. Okay, um, two, two people commented on one thing that I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about, and that was they made the pool the wrong way around. Because the deep end is over where everybody congregates, and the shallow end is on the opposite end. And people realize that when we move the kiddie pool from the shallow end, we move it towards the deep end. So that's a very con great concern about safety, having those. But the idea of putting the 
The kiddie pool closer to what is currently the deep end of the pool was, of course, to get it closer to the parents so they wouldn't have to be in two places at once and have to walk all the way down to the kiddie pool to supervise those kids. They could also stay in that general area where their family has set up their, their belongings. So that's a good question. We're going to have to think about that one. I mean, I mean ideally, you, if, you know, we were trying to keep the existing pool intact, but if we had a clean slate here, the best place to put this pool would be to put it down on this end and take all these uses and combine it with this slide and everything on this end. But, but sometimes you have to make those kind of compromises. I mean, a, a beautiful pool it's not, doesn't make sense at this point. So there, there's a safety issue there that we're going to need to address. Um, Give you some containment there. Okay, here is a question uh, about the fitness activity. Uh, we had two questions. One saying they're really happy to see it still part of the plan. Um, and uh, they think that that's a great amenity for uh, people that we don't currently have. Uh, the other person said if we don't have a fitness center, uh, given that we already have two gyms in the community, how would the space be utilized? And, and that's a good question also because um, that was an area that we've really been scratching our heads about because when you get a chance at the break or at the conclusion, just walk down the hall and go into that space, which is currently being used uh, by the teams. Um, it is a delightful space uh, with wonderful views out both ways. When it was built, it was built as an outdoor space. It's not really uh, a year-round uh, space that is uh, uh, it's exposed to the elements. But it was a, if, if I understand correctly, it was actually a little uh, stack bar. Uh, people came up to the pool uh, to use that space. So, uh, Carrie, Greg, you got, you got your work cut out if we're not going to use that as a fitness center. Well, I, I'd be interested to hear what the input of the community is at large and, and to see if, if any kind of a fitness, even if this size, is even an interest. Um, from our experience, uh, it has been, in fact, most of them are much bigger than this, which could be a challenge if there's too much interest, then you may, may be difficult to get on a treadmill when you'd like to. So. Well, we're going to have to uh, work on that. And, uh, we also have a couple of other issues in here. Good, good comments, good questions. Um, let's talk about another thing. There was a lot of discussion and interest in solar at our last meeting. Quite a few people were quite interested in that. And so the question is, you know, how green is the building going to be? We all know electricity is a huge cost for operating this building. And it's been going up about 9% per annum for a number of years now. So obviously we want to uh, address that. The pool is currently heated with propane. And one of the concepts is using um, uh, solar hot water heating. It's a very good application, especially in our latitude. And, and in fact, we have so many days in the sun, even in the off season. So, fully totally makes good sense. Photovoltaics, uh, Greg over here is LEED certified. Uh, he will be looking at a lot of issues related to making the building uh, greener, uh, more sustainable, at lower cost. With a remodel, it's not as easily done as it is with the construction, however. So they will be taking a look at that. Am I correct in that? No, that's correct. I mean, you know, that's the next, next phase. Yeah. We're doing preliminary design work. Um, this is a good question that came up at the workshop, and I talked to the board members, uh, and we all decided that we had missed something in our process. Um, and that was, uh, what's the condition of the pool? You know, we're looking at the building, we're talking about spending a lot of money, and yet we really haven't thought very carefully about the pool. So Thursday night, the board of directors uh, authorized a contract with a pool engineering firm called Jones and Bonovan, and they're going to be doing uh, two things for us. One thing for sure, which is an evaluation of the existing pool, all the circulation systems, electrical systems, uh, equipment that's used uh, relative to that pool, so at least we have a really good idea of what we have. So we'll be doing that. Um, we've actually awarded contract to them. They're going to be trying to meet with uh, Terry and Greg and, and uh, catch up on the conceptual design process so we have that piece of information. They will also be giving us some rough ideas of what it will cost to uh, do those uh, pool upgrades. So that is now in the process. We just missed it before. Um, 
talk about solar. This question came up last time. Are these pillars load bearing and can they be removed? And Terry's uh, answer last time is yes, they can. Yes, they are load bearing and yes, they can be removed. It just depends on what the budget is. Huh. <laughs> well, that was a good answer. Yeah. That was Greg. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Greg said that. Sorry. He's got that technical brain. Yeah. Um, Okay, another uh, solar comment relative to um, actually going well beyond um, solar simply for this uh, facility, but also looking at the entire community. Um, this one comes later. Um, fire escape from the teen center. Okay, so the team center would have uh, an exit just like this room does, has exits, and we'll continue to have exits out into this uh, space here. Um, commercial kitchen came up, uh, we, there was some discussion about that last uh, meeting, the workshop, and the consensus that we heard anyway was that uh, people didn't feel the expense and space necessary for a commercial kitchen probably made sense to the types of activities that would be taking place here. Um, Terry and Greg uh, pointed out that if you do have a commercial kitchen, it comes with a lot of code requirements, fire suppression systems and other things that are, that are quite expensive, uh, not only on initial construction, but for maintenance as well. And so that was the evolution of the concept of a non-commercial kitchen, which could still be used in support of a group of gatherings, but uh, we would be doing, the association would be doing no food preparation at this site. That, that was the concept. So the person that asked about the commercial kitchen, is that germane to your question? I, I think that was covered. Um, what is a gym? So let's so, talk so a little bit more about the gym and um, uh, where it might be and, and uh, Excuse me? Excuse me? Sorry? Almost, almost the no, 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 I just want to, that was my question. I just want to, that was my question. I want to just clarify. There you have number two, and yeah. you sit, you're talking about in the future you might do a gym. In the meantime, there's a food stand, so that's a big rectangle of space. What is the plan for that in the meantime, that giant rectangle? When it's not there. Yeah. Okay, right now, uh, it could be used for some some of the golf cart parking that we just mentioned earlier. Right now, it's, it's primarily a landscape area, and it could be also an enhanced more area for the picnic barbecue area. It's it's um, it's a good question. We haven't put a, we haven't done a drawing of that area yet, but there's a lot of functionality to go there. Obviously, if the gym is of interest for a future phase, we wouldn't want to put too much money and energy into that space if we're going to be digging it up later on. So planting, landscape. Barbecue area, or that kind of thing, makes more sense. The, the piece of that that's closest to the building, right there, that's currently inside the pool enclosure. So about uh, a little bit less than one half of that would be in an expanded area. So the pool enclosure would be more generously sized. Uh, those of you who come down here on a hot day see that we're pretty packed in here. There's not really enough seating for people. There's not enough lounge area. And so the concept would be to push that pool in, uh, out of the ways. And that space would be programmed for pool uses uh, in that interim period. Seems like that's a good use for it generally, actually, if we're having a lot of people coming. For okay, it to be an extension um, of the pool area. Okay, okay uh, that question comes later. Okay, we're getting pretty close. Okay, the water slide, uh, relative to increased liability, and this is a question that does come up when you add uh, certain kinds of amenities to the community. Uh, uh, we actually will pose that to our broker as a formal question, but informally we have talked to them in the past about similar things. Uh, another one that keeps coming up uh, repeatedly in this particular community is whether or not we should have a skateboard park of some kind. And again, the liability issue is concerning people. Will that 
mean that we have an increased premium uh, cost. Uh, the actual carrier that we have is involved in a lot of resort areas uh, throughout the entire nation. So our insurance program that we have is actually a program that works very, very well for uh, large slides. A um, large number of associations actually have those in place and they are uh, easily covered under your uh, policies. But we'll get some more specific information about whether or not that entails uh, any add-ons to your uh, premium costs. Okay, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. I'm almost to the end of the cards. Uh, there's some general questions that we'll take care of at the, uh, when the board's having their discussion. Okay. Oh. Uh, question about code requirements for parking at the community center building. Uh, so if you gentlemen you could address that. It's um, a lot of times we do these kind of facilities with a lot of overlap, a lot of redundancy. Um, the swimming pool generates a certain number of parking in a building. Its functionality generates, but sometimes there's overlap. People that are inside the building would also be, um, be using the pool possibly at the same time. So it's it's kind of it's a hard thing to pinpoint, and most jurisdictions don't have the proper code to address this question. So um, part of what we would do is is analyze what your current needs are uh, for the existing what you have existing right now, and how many people are actually using the pool and generating parking, and then um, and then we have a set. The, the new functionality that we've added, great to like that. Uh, we haven't approached the planning department on, on the site plans yet. That will be one of our next steps. Um, in the zoning ordinance, there is a provision for existing buildings if you don't add any square footage or add square footage that would require less than two additional stalls, you don't need to change your parking count. Um, so a little gray on the answer, but I feel that there would be a good argument um, to indicate that we have the, at least the same number of stalls that are existing because until the gymnasium comes in play, we don't need any existing stalls. And in fact, I think we could argue that the uh, proposed change in use would be less intensive because we've got less banquet, we don't have the uh, commercial kitchen, we've got um, the fitness component, but it really doesn't drive any additional need for parking up here. So we think we've got a pretty good case for having at least at most, the <coughs> result, perhaps less. And, and I think the backup plan on this is to, to look at, you know, if we if we get through our assessment with working with the county, try to determine exactly what they can bear, what, what we think is sufficient by, you know, the, the comment earlier about adding carts increases our capacity quite a bit, and then also exploring the idea of adding some additional parking up here, which, I'm hoping we don't have to do because I would like to leave that as intact if we can get it. To, but we have options that we can have. Okay. Uh, we have four more uh, questions on cards. Uh, five more questions on cards. We have some raised in here. Well, let me get through the cards first. Uh, we have a question about the distance from the car park to the entrance being quite long. Uh, especially on the, the gymnasium is added. So could you explain a little bit about how the drop-off zone might work? The, uh, the distance, um, the, the parking lot proper is basically what we currently have. We did add about 10 more feet to here. So the distance is to your front door that you're currently experiencing is about the, is the same. The only difference is, is that in certain cases where this distance becomes a challenge for people, we, you know, this was the idea behind adding this, this drop-off in this location where people could get dropped off yes. and then go park down here for if, if, if it becomes difficult. I had two questions that came in that reiterated a, a, a discussion that was at the workshop that was uh, fairly spirited and a number of people interested. It has to do with swimming and whether it's going to be a year-round facility uh, and whether the hours can be uh, increased. And um, 
the takeaway we had from that um, after the workshop was a, a comment, I can't remember which person made it, um, if they're here I apologize for not remembering, but a comment was, we don't really need to have a covered pool. We have generally a relatively mild climate. If we simply had a heated pool year round and access to it, well clearly we're not going to staff up a pool in February for three laps forward. But on the other hand, can people get access in those off months when we don't have our major programs going on? And could they get uh, uh, access perhaps at hours where the pool's not open uh, through the normal uh, pool hours? So uh, Greg and uh, Terry and I and staff uh, thought this through, and we just thought that by having a separate entrance, uh, we could create a way to get people access to the pool through that separate entrance. Entrance when the rest of the building is actually closed down. Uh, so that would give that. And then Terry and Greg came up with the idea if we could go to the uh, floor plan. I thought this was pretty clever. Yeah, we did. We did. I didn't explain that. Thing. Yeah, I just think so. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the idea was when we're in the season, which is basically in the summertime, the pool needs to be staffed, and we would bring people through here, and they would have access to the pool back out here. <clears throat> the rest of the year, when that is not staffed, people could access the pool through here through some sort of uh, card control system. There's a number of systems that are out there. <coughs> we actually, when we bought our new software, we made sure it would support all kinds of different uh, building access systems. We already have the software. We already have the uh, control panels. So this is an e easily done thing. So this would be the access. But in addition, people could come up and access through a similar uh, gate and go into the fitness center. So that could be a 24-7 fitness center uh, through some sort of an access system. We can lock. We can lock this door here, and we, and they'll have access to the bathroom. So this 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 part can be all shut down, and then this could be open, like Bill said, twenty four seven. So it's accessible. So I think that's a, kind of the takeaway that we all had from the comments that were made at the last meeting. Uh, seems to be a, a good idea. Uh, we might even want to look at doing some interim things related to that uh, prior to doing the major construction. Is it about this one issue? Yeah. Related to the gate access to the pool, what hours is that going to be? Who monitors it? What if somebody goes in there on their own after hours? Well, that's really good questions because we have we have concerns about that. Um, we will obviously have to use some surveillance cameras and some other things to monitor that through our 24-hour dispatch center because you could have a number of issues that would come off. And so a, lot, a little detail that the board will have to deal with but so it is technically point, feasible. At yeah. this point, they're expecting that to be open 24 hours a day also? Well, I'm saying it's possible. The board would have to decide if we're going to do it. Uh, remember, we're at a design stage. We're not putting policies in place on how to operate the building. But, uh, good questions, good questions. OK, uh, will there be a membership fee for the GM? It's very similar to this lady's question, something the board is going to have to decide at a uh, future point. Uh, what about the bar? I'm not quite sure what this question means. Can you explain, please? I was just wondering about the little bar area right here. Okay, the bar is actually going to end up becoming a service kitchen area, but clearly, if an event was happening here, we could use a service bar as opposed to a permanent uh, structure like we have now. Yeah, Which I would just wonder if that's going to be remodeled or kept or... It, it, exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, let's see if I got that. Um, you're on swimming. Okay, I also got a number of comments where people want to actually talk about the, the entire concept <coughs> that this particular scheme represents. And should we actually look at other concepts in addition to this? Uh, so I, I think there's some really good comments here. But if you would, I'd like to hold them and introduce them to the board, because that's really a board discussion, not a Terry and Greg discussion, when we get to that part on the agenda. So I won't lose those. I'll say, hey, board, someone thinks we ought to do something a little different in this space. 
Uh, so they can uh, talk about that. And I have one, two, Oh, wait, I can answer the one. Just keep pushing me out. No, that's it, too. One, two, three, four, five, uh, five questions, but the sixth one I can answer right now. Is the administration building paid off now, or when will it be paid off? Yes, it is. It was actually a perch. It was built uh, using uh, cash the association already had on hand. So that was actually paid as it was built. Okay. Oh, another one. Oh, this is a great comment. Uh, if locker rooms, uh, locker room restrooms are to be utilized uh, on the lower floor, suggest transposing men's and women's restrooms so the women's are more accessible to the rest of the lower floor because they're more frequently used. <laughs> We have a couple questions from the board. You want those uh, regarding the same kind of comments that you were getting? Well, sure, that's a good idea. You want them now? I didn't see that. Please use the mic. Thank you. Um, I like your concept. I like what you agree, Dan. Uh, I think you took into great consideration what was talked about last time. My particular only question at this time is in regards to. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. We just got to talk into it. You're good. My question at this time, having um, taken care of uh, Invalid 24 7, um, is the upper parking up here when you go on number 13 on the site plan for the existing service drive? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Right now we have three we have three handicapped parking up there. Whether it's either for additional parking to stay or parking to park to unload a wheelchair, etc., so they can come in this door to the upper level. I don't see anything in that particular area that's going to be designated for handicapped car <coughs> drop off. I think number nine is very difficult. You know, I, mean, I had a 91 year old father and I'm not a spring chicken and to push him up that hill is a great deal of difficulty. But it was nothing for me to drive up, unload him, put him in here, take my car and go back to the parking lot. Is there a feasibility of at least having some handicapped drop off parking by a car? Thank you. Okay, I don't see a problem with that. In fact, you know, we need to have access on that side of the building, this side of the building anyway, for fire too. So this this isn't gonna go away. And this I think we're showing current paving is there, right? Is that what it is? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, other uh, questions? I've got one. Yeah. Bill, I've got one. I've got two sure. quick ones. Yeah. Number one, um, as long as you got this uh <laughs> I'm putting on my other hat when we had fire and uh, emergency services. It would be nice to have some kind of emergency gate over by what now is the kiddie pool because of, in case of an earthquake or some kind of situation in the building, the only emergency egress, no, the other side. The other side. The in the parking lot. The only emergency egress is that either back through the building or in that narrow walkway. So I'm thinking some kind of emergency gate over there that's good facilitate exit, exit to the uh, parking lot. And on the, the floor plan for the second floor, a couple of the old folks over here were asking, um, what would it take to put bathrooms, two small bathrooms at the back of the teen center so that they wouldn't have to trace through the entire facility to use the restrooms on the second floor? I think in the area now where there's an employee bathroom back in that, in that far corner. You see what I mean, Terry? Yeah. Would that, would that take up too much room for, you know, restrooms for the kids? Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, it's, uh, the plumbing's already there. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think it's, it's a raised floor. Right? So it makes a lot of sense. Hmm? 
Right? Even if they were ever to use, lock this and use it after, after hours, they have their own bathroom. Yeah. yeah. So it makes a bunch of sense. One more board question. Yeah, Mike Rankin, are you considering uh, photoelectric solar? Discussions with the electrical engineer, it's a limited amount of roof area, so it's part of a study we would do to see how economical that would be versus putting PV panels out on some of the site that's got more uh, appropriate orientation to the sun. But we will look at maximizing PV if that's something that uh, is of interest to the community. Anybody else on this slide that Bob did uh, hand off the break? Uh, Jack Lister, uh, with recognition of the bar question, is the presumption in this design that most of the major functions that are now held here in terms of kitchen and bar facilities are going to be handled in the other building if it's done? Is that a presumption for this? That's one of the issues, uh, Jack, that's one of the issues the board has to address. We have a number of cards that came out on that very uh, specific issue about do we have overlaps in how the buildings are used and where's the best place to have certain kinds of functions. I think that's one of the most critical decisions the board's going to have to make uh, as they approach this. Uh, what should this building be? And a number of people have totally different ideas about even from this design is what this building ought to be. And I want to have that discussion with the board a little bit later. So, Jack, can I do that at that time? Oh, absolutely. I yeah, it's a great, sure it's a great question. Uh, we always knew figuring out what to do with this building would be more difficult than figuring out what to do with the other building. Uh, it, it always was a, the more difficult problem of figuring out the, the role of the building. So, uh, Mike, let's get some mics to these hands back. I got one right here. Oh, That's you got one right here. Okay, Bill. Yeah, I would just like you to consider if you're thinking about putting solar anywhere, it doesn't have to be on buildings. One really interesting way to do it is to put it on shade structures for the parking area. Uh, people will crowd around bushes trying to find a little shade in the summertime. And uh, it would be great to put it up about eight feet or seven feet in the park in there. Right, there's a lot of vendors out there now building those kind of structures. And everything it does is like, yes, definitely. Um, the other thing it does is it keeps, uh, there's a, solar issue with sun hitting blacktop and it's radiating heat and that would also help with that as well and there's many benefits to doing that okay uh, the people that were clapping uh, to bill's comment i want to ask two questions to understand your clapping a little more carefully uh, you were clapping to two comments one had to do with shade structures how many were clapping because they wanted shade structures to park the cars under just just lift your hand so i can know the other part of that was photovoltaic uh, cells being placed on top of the shade structure. Okay, so we got strong photovoltaic uh, use, and uh, shade seems to be a good idea. Well, there are some landscaping requirements, so there will be landscaping. Let's go, uh, in, in, oh, here's a mic right here. Could, would you give me your name, please? Because some, uh, Jack started out giving names. I think that's kind of neat. My name is Sally Monger. I've lived here forever. <laughs> I have great concerns about the fact that this is not a handicap friendly picture on, on the upper level. And I have used this building as a handicapped person. I'm using it today as a partially handicapped person. There is no place, I am mobile myself, but there's no place for me to park and come in to the second floor. That walkway is a killer. And if you're pushing somebody in a wheelchair, it's a killer. There are not, I mean, there are more than three handicapped people in this, in this community, I am sure, because some of them are almost as old as I am, and they've been here almost as long as I have. And I find this is not handicap uh, friendly. It's way too far to the bathroom. And it's way too hard to get in. And there's no parking for this level. Well, one of the things on the, on the handicap and accessibility of the building is there is a potential to add an elevator. Um, there is, by code, it may not be required. But if the community uh, has that voice that they want to make sure that we do have accessibility for everyone on both floors, which is great. Um, my father had been in a wheelchair for 20 years, so I, I know the things that you need to, to do uh, to get accessibility for everyone. Um, and that elevator is probably 
Jersey Little Charms number in the 120 to $140,000 range. But that is an expense that's going to be um, offer accessibility to everybody. It's also going to ease how uh, different items get in the building, furniture, uh, party equipment. So it becomes a little easier for that. Uh, so it's a tool use. It's not just for the accessibility for others. Now, I noticed that nobody on this side of the room has wrestled the mic away from uh, Wayne Clark here. Uh, let, let me get him a chance. I'm competing with Bob Kaminsky. That's tough. Uh, who's got the mic on this side? Are you ready to make a comment? And then let's go to this gentleman here. Uh, who's passing that mic around? Bob? Yeah. Just, there's a gentleman right here on the other side of the pillar that wants the mic out here. He's finished. Okay. He sees you now. Okay. Over here, who has the mic? Okay. We're talking about photo We were going to do names. My name is Marsha. Barbara, I've been here about two years. We're talking about photo electric. How about wind power? Because that's far more efficient. I hear you. I hear you. The question was what about wind power? We actually generate quite a bit of wind in this way. Um, look at, when you look at it comprehensively, there's a lot of options, um, all the way from simple installation, dual glazing, heat, photovoltaics, wind power, all those things are options that will be considered in the go process. It's going to be based on what's the return on the investment and how long is it going to take to get that return and preserve. Uh, government uh, grants, uh, incentives to do that. Local utility companies, what's the rates that you're paying here? Um, all those factors into a formula that makes good informed decisions on what you want to do with it. Making this building more right, yeah, As far as sustainability and energy use, it's we, we usually try to go to passive uh, systems first and design from the exterior of the building in, trying to use the landscape as our first shading device uh, to keep the heat and solar gain off the building, out of the building, because if you can do that, your, your battle is about halfway done. Um, the other is looking at systems such as PV and solar water and wind energy, trying to, to reduce those elements to have less operating parts so that your failures uh, and your maintenance costs are lower too. They're all really valid. Um, options. It's really <coughs> which direction we want to go and what the value is to the community for doing that. Um, we have had wind generation become a, a little bit of an issue because acoustics and the noise that are generated by the, the fans. So that's one thing to consider when we're doing that process. Okay, there's a mic over here now. I believe you do. Yeah. Buddy Lex, uh, a couple of simple questions. Uh, you guys were talking about the structure taking down the pillars. How about the rest of the building? Is the basement uh, underneath structurally sound to last many more years? As part of the assessment that we did a verification of, we had a structural engineer come through, and the, we called the basic bones of the building seem very serviceable. Um, the basement area in item five is right now mechanical equipment. We're looking at moving that to the area six, which is underneath uh, the kitchen. Dance that's going to oh, yeah, the dance floor. That's going to require some uh, excavation because that's not a, a, con a finished space at this point. Um, but the basic question, the basic answer is yes. The structure of the building is, is very good shape. Uh, in some of your expansions here for uh, the picnic area and so forth, the existing trees are going to stay. Be removed. Are we going to replace them with the shade? I know you said we're going to add some shade to it, but the, the, like the existing trees yeah, we, out there. You know, we got that comment. And when they start the preliminary design process, that's when all those details come forward. Okay. Uh, buddy, the, at the last meeting uh, workshop, there was a presentation of the verification report uh, that was done on the 2007 Gentry Engineering Report, and so the building has been looked at very carefully. By mechanical and structural engineers and electrical engineers. Okay. That, need, that was all presented last time. Okay. Do we need to split this room and the board discusses it? Do we have that any functions that we have to have this room split? 
Well, that's the question I think the board's going to have right. to decide. Okay. Do we have enough functions at this facility to justify some of these costs of upgrade? That's, that's one of their basic decisions. Okay, the big question I've got, sir, I understand you just got your previews this morning, but if we at least hear what that bottom line is, that you think this is going to cost? Yeah, you can on the 25th, as I announced. Yeah. Uh, gentleman over here, I believe, is next to the black bottom. Doesn't we have anybody over here? <laughs> We're going to go to the slide next. So. This, this is the um, I want to go back to the um, accessibility issue. Um, I have worked for a couple of institutions where when we deal with ADA and access, their goal was to meet minimum standards for the, um, to, to meet ADA federal law. However, by doing that, they, they did save money by doing that, and however, they did not meet the needs of the individuals. And uh, I'm just going to talk about myself. My needs are getting worse and worse. Worse and worse. worse. <laughs> <laughs> I teach college, can you tell? Uh, yeah, so my needs, you know, we're, we're all at that stage where we're going to need access. And so as you deal with the accessibility issues, you know, think about not just meeting the minimum needs, but also what's going to happen in the future and the use of this facility. Good, good point, and we, we all at some point in time are going to have accessibility issues. Let's go to this side of the room, who has the microphone? Well, I do, I think, my name is Liz, and I think you just asked my question. I was wondering if the ADA had been consulted, and is a ramp sufficient for a building of this size? Thank you for that comment. Let's do another mic on this side of the room here. Um, Melissa, are you going to comment? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. Hi, Eric Soderstrom. I just know you guys got here earlier. I encourage you to look at the parking lot today because it's absolutely overflowing. We're parking way down there. So you can probably see what we got here. Um, and also on the parking line that we're scheduled for 10 to 12, I think, and we haven't even gotten to the other comp line. So I just want to encourage you to move the line. Yeah, we do need to move on. A uh, couple more questions. I have one over here, Sandy. I've got a right here. Let's go here first. Uh, one thing I, got, I have three here. I was just wondering if these plans uh, include anything like upgraded uh, um, systems for sound, for instance, um, and a uh, possibility of like Wi Fi. We've got those in budgeting, but it, it's something that will be happening further down the design is really what, what needs, what type of equipment, what room that goes into. It's uh, really Let's go to the west side of the room. Right here, and then we have one over here, and I'd like to maybe cut it off there. I think we've really kind of beat this one to death, and we'll move on to the other facility. Your question, Anthony? Yes. Uh, my name is Mary Brando. But since so many people have already talked about this issue, I think most of my questions have been answered about it, but I just want to comment about the accessibility. It's raining and cold all winter. You can't expect anybody, especially a mother with a stroller and babies, to go up that ramp to get up to the second floor. That's just ridiculous. Um, like that other gentleman said, you have to look at what the needs of the people are. And I think that it, it really requires an elevator for every kind, of, every kind of need that we could possibly have. The ranch just does not do it. What if you're on the, the second floor and you want to go to the snack shop? How are you going to get there? So um, I think it's only wise and kind of foolish not to have an elevator. Okay. We've got four comments on accessibility. So I think the, uh, Terry and Greg are going to be addressing that. Hi, yes, I'm Trey Kubota and uh, Chad to the gentleman behind me regarding the parking lot. As I was coming in uh, this morning, a woman pulled up her pickup and she said, why are there so many cars in the parking lot? What's going on here? And I said, well, there's a meeting upstairs, a community meeting to discuss facilities. She says, oh, she says, I was afraid it was for the pool. So, <laughs> so if you add what's going to happen to the pool today, although it doesn't happen often, they're, they're going to be parking in the streets. Yes. Thank you, Frida. Okay, this this has been some really good comments. Like I said, we will capture all these. Uh, I really appreciate everyone being focused on what we were 
trying to accomplish here. You did an excellent job. The cards work better this time around. Uh, so I think I'll try the cards also on the hardware facilities. So right now we're going to take a little bit of a break because we ran long on this facility. We have the drawings in here that you can look at, make comments on. We have food over here in the uh, current bar, uh, the future kitchen. So let's take a presentation of some of the uh, current things we know about this facility. So, Terry, if you could go to my uh, slides. Oh, I just thought, uh, one thing I forgot, we are announcing these meetings uh, with emails. Those of you that filled out your request questionnaires and gave us your email addresses should have gotten one of these uh, last week. So if you did not and you would like to, please call member services at the office and uh, give them your email information and we'll be sure you get these. And what is that, Phil? The number? No, the thing you just held up. What is it? It's an email. About what? About a community forum that we're going to have on Saturday, July the 13th at 10 a.m. at the community center. No. Okay. Um. <laughs> Let's quickly go through uh, go through this. Uh, back up. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Okay, a quick repeat of what uh, we did last time for the folks that weren't there. Uh, this building, the community center, uh, this is how it is currently utilized. So as you can see, 80% of the use is related to the swimming pool. Uh, then we have uh, recreation programs. Uh, right now those have been mostly focused on uh, children's programs. This year, for the first time, uh, we have budgeted and are starting adult recreation programs. Uh, this uh, slice here is the teen center use. Uh, this area here is group events, people uh, renting the building and using it for various events. And then lastly, uh, these are the clubs that use the building on a regular basis. some other uh, discussion going on about the technological capability of the general manager. Uh, this particular one talks about uh, how that use is uh, divided. And so when you look at all the groups between 2009 and 2012, over a four-year period, about 65% of the use of this building for group use was by the general public. About 35% was hit by lake-associated uh, groups. Uh, when you look at groups that are greater than 100 people, virtually all of the use of this facility is by uh, general public groups, about uh, 90%. Okay, now this is what the Hartman facility use looks like. Again, uh, this is 2012. The restaurant ac uh, accounts for about 60% of the use of that building. The golf operations account for about 40% of the use of the building and then the concerts account for about 3% of the use. So that's what we currently have at the uh, Harvard facility. Which, which one is the bar figure in? <laughs> <laughs> the bar's in this one. Let's <laughs> pull it out. Okay, so, so the, the restaurant's this piece and the bar be this piece. I'm, I'm not sure. 
Okay, we have a green view room at the uh, at the uh, Harmon facility. Some of you probably have used that. That's a little room that's uh, back behind the kitchen. Uh, we do schedule that room and allow groups to utilize it for all kinds of events. Uh, it nominally seats 60 people. It's kind of tight at 60. Uh, but anyway, here's what that looks like. About 40% of that room is used by the general public, so we do have people coming in, you know, Kiwanis clubs and Lions groups and other kinds of people uh, that are from the uh, southern uh, uh, Lake County area. But mo most of the use of that facility, about 6% of the use, is actually by Hidden Valley Lake uh, groups. So it's just the reverse of this facility, which is somewhat ironic, seeing as that one's outside the gates and this one's inside the gates. Now, I showed you this last time. This is how our use of the facility. This is not the pool use. This is not the recreation programs. This is what people reserve the facility to use it for a group event. These are uh, totals for four years. And you can see this building gets used um, primarily by groups between 40 and 90 and in quite a few groups, just over 100 on that side. So the use of um, over 100 uh, groups is about 60% and under 100, about 40% when you come to the number of people. Um, over that four years, this facility was used about 92 times, so it's just roughly twice a month. Okay, so this is what the Greenview room looks like and how it's used, and obviously it's smaller groups because it's a smaller room, but I did want to point out a couple of things that's interesting about this, that uh, this information was given to Terry and Greg so they could slice some of the potential rooms of this facility, but uh, basically 90% of all the use is less than, than 60 people. Um, less than 60% um, I mean, great, greater than 60% is only about 10%. When you have less, less than 30%, uh, is about 40% of the use. And we actually have about 13%, which is less than 20. So we have uh, quite a range of uh, group sizes. So that was all I wanted to present to just kind of get you thinking about how this facility is used, how the Harvard facility is used. I'm going to turn it over to Terry and Greg. Um, so they can start talking about the other uh, building inside. Because it's too small, 
the uh, location of the dining room. You have to walk through the bar to get to to the bathroom. There's a lot of functional issues there that um, that if it was a different kind of facility would be enhanced. The other thing is, you know, we wanted to address uh, community-wide, um, even though the tennis uh, group is not a, a large group here, that if, if they did have a couple additional tennis courts, um, maybe that group would increase, the interest would increase. Uh, the, uh, in order to have any kind of tournament, you need at least to have four courts. We wanted to address that. Uh, so um, uh, the other thing that we like to see done is anytime we design a golf clubhouse, we like to think about the experience of both the golfer and the community member who wants to come here and eat. Um, what they see from the, the uh, dining, dining room and you're kind of missing that opportunity right now. You don't have a strong orientation from the dining area to your golf and you're, you kind of have to look at it like a park. And the orientation, I like this north, northwest orientation dining room because in the evening when you come for dinner um, and as the sun starts to set, it creates these beautiful shadows from trees across the fairways and I think that's a real special tree. You don't get to see that, these green lawns, even though you're not a golfer, which, which kind of ironically I'm not. I designed these buildings, I've been invited to speak on golf clubhouse design um, at national co conferences, but they asked me if I golf. No, I don't. I'm sorry, I don't golf. I'm just, I'm just not coordinated enough to do that. But, um, but I do enjoy designing these facilities, and I think they could be made special for both the golfer and the community at large. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about what this plan is doing. The current, the current facility, um, the current golf house is right about where this number 12 is. It sits right in, in the middle of this parking lot. And uh, your barbecue area is here. Uh, these two ten tennis courts currently exist. Um, your driving range starts at about this, lo this location here. It goes this, this direction. Um, the, uh, there's some area back here that we saw as, as a great opportunity to change. Um, if we were to do a new facility, a golf facility, a clubhouse facility, that this would be a much better location to address a lot of the, the functionality that I just mentioned earlier. One being um, a much, a much uh, more expanded food and beverage operation. The addition of, of uh, larger and more flexible community uh, uh, rooms to allow for larger groups and smaller groups. I mean, when you look at the survey, what's been done out here, the reason why you don't know, see a lot of larger groups is because that facility doesn't hold a large, a large group. It's a small, the green big room is too small, it's an awkward shape to hold any kind of a wedding event if you were to sell the use of that. Um, the, uh, some of the other attributes are, um, we wanted to maintain your site for your concerts and your barbecue area, which is still currently in the same location. The only difference is that we've expanded the lawn area and used our deck. We have a, we're showing a wraparound deck around the whole uh, plan, and that could be also used for the stage or for a performance. Um, can be done on the deck. Um, so basically, you access the uh, the front door through this drive tree line driveway. Um, there would be for the golfers. There would be a backdrop area here. Um, the main entry is in this location. Uh, service is over here where number six is for deliveries. Um, and you can come back, park your car. There's roughly. 140 parking stalls in this location, and in addition to that, there's 24 down here um, for, for expansion. Um, so that would give you sufficient number of parking, parking uh, stalls to satisfy larger groups. The only thing is that your concert days are gonna be impossible to have everybody park on site, but this at least gives you more parking um, than you currently have. The uh, other small additional things, uh, we wanted to get this building more oriented. The nice thing is, is you have three opportunities for views. Where the current facility pretty much just looks this direction, 
this this building has the opportunity to look west towards the ninth fairway. It looks north or northwest towards the lake, so it gets an opportunity for the pond and the fountain to have a better uh, view of that, and you can hear the water from the deck. And then to the east, um, we're looking at relocating the driving range so we can get 250 yards, which is um, much better than we currently have, and, it, and it's in a position to where from the golf part of the uh, clubhouse that they can they can they can keep control over the play through their visibility of the driving range and the um, card staging area and the number one tee box. The number one tee box has been a bit of a challenge. The number one hole. So the suggestion was working with Wayne is maybe look at possibly moving up the tees um, to this location. So from the golf clubhouse, you'll get a chance to see people teeing off and it shortens the whole a little bit to make it a little bit more playable starting off. Um, number 11 here is a practice area. Um, practice, a short game practice area for pitching, putting greens, maybe uh, practicing out of uh, sand traps. So by uh, relocating the, uh, the driving range here, hitting their balls into this corner, there would probably be some fencing here to protect the cars and to protect people um, as much as we can uh, from uh, balls that are hit over, uh, sliced over in this direction. Um, also, we would probably need to add some fencing along this side as well to do that. Let me go to the plan. Okay, go on to the floor plan. As I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the primary uh, goal of this plan was to give you some flexibility to be able to expand and contract the, um, the uh, banquet areas to accommodate different size groups, possibly even two groups at one time. To, uh, without a problem and conflicting with golf operations or even operations in the bar or the dining areas. But basically the primary entries here, there would be a hostess station where number two is that could greet people, a small little waiting lounge area, and to the right is all your uh, golf, uh, golf shop, um, pro shop area. There's a, there's 11, say, um, to be a, a, a small uh, meeting room uh, that could be used for for um, possible uh, board meetings. There could be small group meetings. There could be a dinner hosted there, um, and that would be here with a view out towards the pond and the deck. The deck's not shown in this plan, but I'm just trying to imagine that the deck kind of connects all the way around to all these doors. The um, the bar grill area is in this location here is the bar seating, but we can screen it off along this line here to secure it from the corridor system. So when people are in the dining room, they can come through here and get to the bathroom, which is in this location without going through the bar or the grill area. So we've, um, we've, done a, we've done this trick before on some clubhouses where you have weather like yourself on really nice days. If we have the roof go over part of this deck, so there'd be outdoor areas with um, some shade protection. Um, we also propose that that roof go over the bar area. But what, what we're showing here is primary bar seating on the inside, but on those nice days, we would open up the wall, which is basically built from the bar top up. We open that up, and then you have a kind of an indoor outdoor bar. We can pull some bar seating on this other side, and the other thing we like to do is lower the bar itself down to seating height. So the bartender would actually go down this ramp and be um, at a lower position. So anybody who's sitting here, the bar's not blocking their view out to the golf course. And so this becomes this really sort of California lifestyle type of a bar setup that really allows everybody to experience the beautiful um, nature that you have out here. The other thing that we're doing is one to anchor these spaces also with fireplaces. So these are back-to-back -back fireplaces here and another back-to-back -back fireplace here. And actually this one could be used outside for some seating around an outdoor fireplace at this location. The, um, 
The wall that separates the bar grill area from the dining area, there could be flexibility in this wall. We can have it so there's a pair of French doors on both sides of the fireplace, and you can open those up to open this whole space up, or you can shut these doors down. We're not showing them, but just kind of imagine there are doors being there. But we can shut these doors down to separate the, the activity that occurs here from more of a quiet dining experience at night. The uh, see seating capacity. Um, let's see. There's uh, there's 12 bar seats here. There's there's 14 on this side. Uh, we have 32. Um, seats in the bar grill area. In this dining area, there's um, 64 seats here. And and then if we work our way down, the kitchen is centralized. So the kitchen, which is an expanded size kitchen, um, so that uh, your food and beverage operation can serve a, a more broader menu and to be able to service more people. We've, we've, we've designed a, a bigger kitchen into this plan that allows for both servicing of the, ban the banquet area and also servicing, um, which is this location here, and also be able to serve the bar and grill and be able to go outside directly through uh, this kitchen here to service people that might want to eat or drink on the deck. Um, one of the things we like doing in our flexibility of this plan is there's, 40, there's 48 um, seats here there's uh, six eight tops six eight tops here 48 here and and there's the ability to be able to do two things we can put partitions that are that are movable in these locations so that you can maintain a group of 48 and or you can double the size of this room put a partition push up this partition for you have 96 or you can open up all three of these and expand it into the to the um uh, dining area for large community dinners. You can get up to 140, possibly 150, and then we can even get bigger by opening up the doors. And right now we're showing double doors, but I would suggest we have sliding glass doors here and open up these walls to this deck looking west towards this um, night fairway and expanding these rooms to the deck. And you can almost get Again, half of, half as much seating that we're showing here to be on the deck, so you have a very large space for a very large gathering. So the idea was to build all that flexibility into this plan, to be able to accommodate both groups in the community groups and groups from the outside, because it can be a revenue generator. So the board will have to look at at, at the operations of this and be able to crunch some numbers to see if it makes sense. If if it doesn't make sense. We start dropping off some of these, these rooms here and decreasing the size of this facility if there's no if, if the need isn't great enough for, for this kind of um, size and flexibility. Let's see. This is the bathroom I mentioned earlier. The golf shop. Um, direct access to cart staging area here. This is the starter. Uh, counter so they got great visibility out the back of the number one tee box and the, um, the uh, driving range. This would be all retail environment here with the golf pro, um, the golf director in, in number 16, and then 17 would be a changing room uh, for trying on uh, golf apparel, and 18 would be a, a storage for uh, shoes and, and retail of apparel. That supporting this space. Um, 12 and 15, I see those as IT, um, some storage, and some custodial space uh, in this location. Uh, there's also, it's not labeled here, but this would be bar, bar storage here. So we, we have plenty of storage. One of the things about the kitchen that we wanted to look at possibly too is do a kind of an open kitchen. So that when you come in here, there could be a large opening on this side of the kitchen to be able to see and make it more of a show kitchen, kind of like what you have, but maybe more enhanced. Um, and uh, there's that opportunity to, to do that as part of kind of the heart of your whole facility. The rest of this is just walk-ins and 
cold storage and there's a um, food and beverage office here um, with, with a bathroom that's required by code to have a bathroom in the kitchen. So that, that pretty much sums up. Did I miss anything, Greg? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, the other thing we've done is we felt like um, in the event area here that there needs to be a, a bathroom um, outdoors supporting it. But this bathroom could do a whole bunch of things. It can cover a golfer when they go from the 9th to the 10th um, on the turn. It could also be used for the tennis players. It can also double as a snack bar. So at the turn, you can serve some food out of there as well. And you could. We've done that before. You order, you have a beverage cart coming out and having that food prepared and ready. There's all kinds of ways to, to service the golf. And, but this little building, it really kind of came into play because of all these different things going on here. And that way you don't have to go have people trace back into the building to use the bathroom. Oh, great question. That's a great question. We, we, yes, we, this plan is not shown. We didn't show that lower floor, but right here there's a ramp and it goes down below. There's about 6,000 square feet of space where there'd be car storage, bag storage, general storage, car maintenance. Um, operationally, it always works better to put the car park below your golf shop. Always works better. What about the water table? There is, that's a, that, you know, that's a great question. We actually were thinking about raising the building four feet, the main floor of the building four feet, and that brings the car barn up four. So it does a couple things by doing that. It, it, it helps with the water table challenges, and it also helps with getting ventilation in that car barn, natural ventilation, which is required if you're using gas or electric cars. You need to have that cross ventilation. You can do it mechanically or you can do it passively, but it's always better to do it passively because it's less cost. So by raising the building up, we've solved a couple of problems with the water table issue. Um, there's still going to be challenges uh, there, but not as much as if we were to drop the car, car facility down 10 feet. So it's all studies that we would have to do with the engineering teams to, to deal with with um, exactly what level that water table is and what those challenge, how we can mitigate those issues through construction. So, Bill, do you want to go to questions? You have cards? <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, we are. Golf Clubhouse in 1997. This is the first project. I've done about a dozen of them. And I got two I'm doing in China right now. Your facility and this opportunity is different than anything I've ever done. And it's not has nothing to do with cost. It has nothing to do with, with how big or how small this is. It has a lot to do with your site. And that opportunity to, to have this building surrounded on three sides by landscape and golf and all this beauty. We've never done it before. Only maybe two sides of the building, and most of the time it's only one. But you have three sides. Take advantage of it. Cards? Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> you want to pass the hat right now? Or? <laughs> Any cards over here? Any cards? No cards? Okay. Uh, and you know what? I, don't want, I shouldn't go much further until I give kudos to Wayne over here because Wayne's brilliant idea to put the driving range here opened up all kinds of doors and solved all kinds of problems with parking and everything else. It gave a longer uh, drive, uh, although I think it's still a little short for Wayne. But, um, <laughs> but, it's, uh, but, I, but that's what this collaborative process is all about. You know, we, we get hired to assist the process, but these ideas don't come from us. They come from all of you as well. And 
this input that we're getting is what makes this thing special. I'm not just a pretty face, Terry. <laughs> We're trying to figure out the trophy you know, for it. Yeah, that, that was a real Hall problem. Uh, yeah. Wayne kept holding out for more room for the trophies. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, there's a ton of questions here, and I am going to cut them into two areas. A lot of questions related to these concepts. So I want to do those first, uh, while Terry and, and Greg are available for us to talk about it. And then lots of questions related to financing, different kinds of options, did you consider doing this, that, and the other thing, which is precisely why we go to conceptual design process. So those are all excellent questions as well. But I want to read those to the board just before they start their discussion so maybe they can answer some of those questions. Uh, not really questions for uh, Terry and Greg. Um, some of these I can answer, most of them I can't. Um, so here we go. By the way, we have 46 cards on the community center. Uh, I think we're going to break that record here. Uh, this is excellent. I, I appreciate people being uh, interested. Um, okay, so here we go. This one I can answer, and that's why I put it on top. Would construction begin to be complete while the existing facility is in place, then the old one torn down and new parking completed? The answer is yes. One of the benefits of relocating the building from its existing site is that it allows you to continue your operations while the new building is being built. So that would be phased in with the construction. This one is only a comment. I love all of it. So we have a fan. Um, if, if the new um, Greenview Room Complex was approved as shown, so I'm thinking they're talking about that side of the building, um, would be guaranteed space for larger uh, community and club activities for holiday and special events. Um, would that preclude approval for similar facility at the community center? So the last part of that question we'll answer later because a lot of people are digging at this question. Uh, so how does this building and that building relate to each other, uh, which is the main reason the board decided to plan them both at the same time. So we'll get to that a little bit later, but the first one has to do with preferential treatment for members relative to scheduling. That's a board policy if they wanted to choose that. Some communities do, some communities don't. Um, is anything planned to happen across the street at the graveled parking lot? What they're talking, uh, what this person's talking about is that area right there that's uh, currently used. Let me tell you the legal status of that. Legally, um, we do not have access to use that space. Uh, there's actually a strip of land uh, on the shoulder of Hartman Road that is controlled by the county. And uh, to officially use that space, we would have to have the Board of Supervisors uh, cause an exemption to that um, no access strip. Uh, I think we could do that if we chose to. We were trying to do a design with all the parking on that side of the road to alleviate the uh, crossing of the road issue, but it obviously would be available for things like overflow to concerts and that kind of thing. But right now, no plans. We look very carefully at that side of the road for possible tennis court locations, but there's not enough room there because of the offsets from the creek. So. It was looked at right now. We're not considering any specific use for it. Am I right in that, Terry, or just a... Yeah, okay. I've got to answer two questions. Um, okay, are you considering covered driving stalls for shade and rain? I believe they're talking about the driving range. And is that another opportunity for solar panels? And, and if that uh, happens, that would be here. The challenge is, is you want those panels faced the south, and you see the north arrow straight up. So they would have to be on the saw to, to do it, um, to make them efficient. But, uh, you know, I, I, we have not done that on a, on a, on a uh, driving range before. I'm sure it's always the first. What about, what about the shade idea? 
the shade's always good to have it. It's just again, it's it's uh, the uh, the space is there, and it's just one of the budget items that you'll have to you have to consider. Uh, this question is uh, related to the uh, building. Will there be room inside for live entertainment? Uh, I think they said inside because we know there's room outside uh, for concerts and that kind of thing. But inside the building, uh, will there be room for live entertainment and will there be a dance floor? I don't see why not. I mean, we're not suggesting any finishes at this point, but um, there's a certain uh, portion of this we can, we can definitely look at possibly putting a dance floor in and, and a stage area where you can have entertainment. Um, probably, since this is primarily glass on these corners, um, and I think, you know, if this fireplace wants to work, this would be a good spot. Uh, you can use this fireplace. Uh, you know, it's something we have to just, we have to analyze and see what makes the most sense. I think what Terry is saying is this, yes, it is possible, and that would be something we'd look at at the preliminary uh, design phase. Uh, let me get through the cards first. I see some people get more anxious to get those microphones very much. Um, how often do you have community meetings? Will a new facility accommodate a larger crowd with better visibility? I think Terry's already explained the flexibility of accommodating larger uh, crowds in this building. Uh, why expose evening dining to a western sun? So there's a question related to that. Well, we have this amazing array of trees along this western edge. Um, back to the site plan. So, so those, those rooms are right here. We're, 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 we're contemplating having a, this, deck, this portion of the deck be covered so the roof would extend past the edge of the, the wall out to the edge of the deck. Um, and we, we probably will, when we start laying seats out there, we may make this deck even bigger, but there's a, there's a row of trees right here that's pushed up against it that should be able to handle that western sun. Okay. Um, the current tennis courts are poorly oriented relative to the rising and setting sun. Um, suggests that all courts be rotated approximately 90 degrees. Yeah, we've done a number of site plans and studied a number of things um, on what would, what would happen if we rotated all of them. Um, there are some compromises that you'll have to make to do that. You, you're going to take out some parking. You may um, lose a couple trees. Um, you'll need to budget for all the course to be redone. There's just uh, uh, those, those are just factors that you'll have to weigh in when making that kind of decision. Here's a question uh, related to the driving range. Uh, can the driving range be used for temporary parking during community events? I, I, I've actually gone, uh, well, maybe about six months ago, I went to a, an event at a private club, and the cars were driving across the lawn area into the, um, across the lawn area, you know, onto the driving range. So it does take a toll on the course. There's things you can do with, what, with the material called grass creep that basically will stabilize the soil and allow for cars or fire trucks to be driven on it. But it looks like grass when you when you see it. So again, that's probably gonna be a board decision. I mean, we're, what we're anticipating is, you know, this can be used for some overflow parking. We do have, Quite a few stalls here for the sort of the large tournaments, 150, 160 people. Um, one thing I didn't mention though is right along this curve around this tree, the willow tree is right here. This big uh, tree here, we're going to be putting some cart parking all along this edge to allow for um, all of you who have carts that want to come here, whether it's golf or dinner or whatever, have a place to park your carts. Uh, oh yeah, right. I did mention that. Um, we also uh, are looking at the private golf cart storage facility in this location right here. That's what this building is. Okay, I have a couple more questions and some comments. Um, 
Here's a comment saying, don't you realize what a top-rated golf facility and restaurant enhances your property value? I believe that's a comment, not a question. Um, what use data do we have to support adding two new tennis courts? Uh, can you make the data available at the next forum? Uh, yes, we can. Um, Hartman Road complex idea, include a ball wall by the tennis courts for a single person to practice against the wall. So is that feasible? Yeah, I don't see it. I don't see a problem with that. Um, there, the problem is, is we got to look at these trees, these drip lines, and make sure balls aren't hitting the trees. And so, um, in fact, we, you know, we show this court pushed right up against this wall. Most likely we're going to have to pull it away because there's some um, trees that are overhanging on this end, so we'll have to move it this way. But uh, you know, we could look at maybe some area like maybe over here, or maybe in here, um, put a wall up and we just practice on. Okay, seems like it's uh, feasible. These are great suggestions. We're getting a bunch here. Now this one is actually someone thinking about the poor general manager who, like Terry, uh, does not play golf. Um, is there room for a mini golf course at the Hartman? <laughs> you, know, you know what? That's not, it's not that funny. <laughs> they, they don't call them mini, they don't call them that. I've, I've seen um, a number of courses that we worked on where they do this small putting six to 18 holes where people actually are using it to practice their putting skills. So that's, you know, I don't know if we have the room to do that or the interest in the golf community to do that, but it's not, it's, they don't call them mini golf courses, but there, but there are, they're sort of like that, but they just don't have all the funky obstacles that you're using. Whoa, whoa, no windmills? For children. For children, yeah. For kids. No, it would be a great thing for families. Maybe that's what we do with that uh, gravel area. Uh, oh, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a that was a really uh, really good idea. I, actually, at Sun River, uh, remember I was there uh, for a number of years. They had one of these um, putting courses where they had nine holes, nine putting greens, and uh, you could even go around twice because near the first hole was where the beer service was. <laughs> I've actually played that kind of golf game before. Um, okay, so we're talking about, uh, this, this question might be one that we have to answer at the next meeting. Um, yes, it is. So I just want to acknowledge that I got it. Uh, and there were two questions like this. It has to do more with um, a little more um, explanation of the slides. Uh, you know, I tried to do a very general overview. So people would like to see a little bit more information about how many people, uh, various types, general public, uh, HBLA related, etc., are, are using the, are using the uh, facilities. So I will put something together on that for the next meeting. Um, this one uh, has to do with the community center, and it came in late. It uh, has to do with the new gate security system, and has that had an impact on outside groups using the community center. In actuality, that system is designed for being able to do one-time group events uh, and get those guests through the gates, so no, it has not had any impact. Um, before reordering the driving range um, towards the existing car barn, golf balls going across into the street, what protection will be in place to prevent that from happening again? So I think they're asking questions about fencing, relative or uh, screening relative to the driving range. Yeah, I mentioned earlier that, um, that this line right here, this is actually more or less a, like a driving range diagram that we, we've uh, drawn here, but um, this line right here would be an obvious location for a fence along the street, along this area to protect the parking and the rest of the people um, that are in the practice area. And then along um, these, these properties here, there would also be some additional fencing wrapping around this location. And I, I would suspect, even with this being 250, we're still going to need some fencing down here. But not as, not, not, it's not going to be the problem that we're currently experiencing. Wayne, do you want to address some of this? Or? Yeah, we're only going to allow 
good golfers on there. <laughs> you know, right now, most of the golf balls that do leave the driving range are a big, ugly slice up and over the fence on the Hartman. And, um, you know, those shots now won't get to Hartman. I mean, like, possibly, depending on what the size of the fence we put, hopefully we can keep everybody in the yard. And, and there's a big oak tree. The way that range is oriented, it actually gets people aiming in a different direction. That's the other problem we have with our current range. Do you kind of aims people down on the right side instead of getting them to move to the left side. So I don't think it's shown here, but there's there's a big tree right here. There's another one over here. So your idea was to get this center to go right between the two trees to get. Yeah, and it does give us 30 more yards. And most of the balls that are hit over the end, is, you know, probably barely clear the fence. So that extra 30 yards, as long as Bob's not hit his driver, is going to be coming. <laughs> Okay, uh, people that still have cards, raise them up. I'm down to four uh, for this part of the meeting uh, before we open it up. Design process. If, in fact, if I could just comment a little bit oh, yeah, on that. We, we have a theming, we call it a theming process where we'll, we'll collect a lot of imagery and a lot of the things we design, we try to fit our buildings into the community and the, the community influences. We design, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen Cash Creek's Call Club House, we designed that. And, and the idea that it was being influenced by the agriculture in that Cape Valley. So um, we would want to definitely solicit your input on through some imagery that we present to you that represents your community, who you are, and your location. So we don't go off designing something that doesn't fit here. So that's part of our process. Uh, this was similar. Um, when do we see elevations to show uh, what the views would be like from the road and how the parking lot is going to fit in with how the building will look from the road and how the signage and all that. Again, that will come up in the next uh, phase. Um, here's a comment, uh, for, probably for the board, but I'll just throw it out right now anyway. Maybe we need to rename the facility. Yes. <laughs> Uh, instead of the apartment area, maybe something else that says him and I like on it. So, uh, yeah. um, this has to do with the bartender. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, are there any children still in the room? <laughs> okay. okay. Um, as you put the bartender lower to protect the view to the golf course, can you put the bar seats down so the others in the bar area don't have to see their bottoms? <laughs> <laughs> And that actually, uh, the seating at the bar is normal chair height. And, and there are it's not there children here. <laughs> children in the back. But um, the, uh, that's the whole idea. It's not just to bring a bartender down, but to bring the seating around the bar to normal chair height, which is, for even handicapped people, is much easier to deal with. And um, it's a more comfortable position to be in to be at the climb up on the bar stand. Okay, that's all the cards I had. So I guess we're ready for microphones to be distributed to the uh, audience. So we'll start with uh, Wayne over here on this side. I'm Angela Burke. I have a question. Um, on the community center, I think that the Uh, that was the assumption. Uh, um, the, when the board first put together the request for proposal, it actually included looking at uh, replacement and remodeling for both buildings. But as we started getting the architects up, uh, they, we started realizing that we had so many uh, issues with the uh, golf and restaurant facility that the uh, retrofitting of that to be, have any kind of normal function would be extremely difficult. Uh, plus, you have the problem of having to tear it down, and, I mean, remodel it while you're trying to operate it. So the board leaned towards the replacement function, and it also solves a lot of site problems. So it seemed like it was a better approach. Now, we have a number of people in the audience today and uh, at the workshop that believe we should have looked at a replacement option for this building. And so I'm going to bring that up to the board when we get into their part of the discussion. And I think they can start thinking about should we have looked at that as well. 
Next microphone in the back. Um, I'm here to represent the tennis community a bit. Apparently someone else is. I wanted to echo my agreement with the sun issue in the morning. It's brutal. And uh, Jerry Burris is the master of putting that ball right in the sun. We can play in. And we're here with some um, kids who play quite a bit. The kids are playing tons of tennis now um, yep. at the courts. Um, what I, and I don't know, we had people from the community come to the matches in the spring, and we were co-champions this year, and it's great. But we had boosters there where we could all watch the tennis, and I don't see where those are going to fit in the new arrangement here. So, um, Currently, there's some bleachers, I think, in this location here. Yes. Yeah, against this court. Correct. Okay. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I think we're going to need to move this court further to the north. It would give you that room to have those bleachers stay there. Yeah, I, don't but, think, I don't think we need the propane there anymore either. When we on this end? Still, yeah, so two could go that way and be oriented the other way, and we could redo the other one when we resurface. The you know, and the other thing too, you might want this could be your like your your finals court, and you can also get some bleachers on this side. Oh, okay. I thought that was like the teaching court. But. Yeah. It, it, it just depends yeah. on how you want right to now, there's, there's all kinds of opportunities. Yeah, I'm just glad we're being thought of because why we're here is the last we heard is we need to those for parking. So thanks for keeping them and we can get a couple more for you. Okay, over this side, we've got a microphone. Bill. Yeah, just more, more on the tennis courts. Uh, I, I think if the, if the new tennis courts were located 90 degrees to what the openings are, that would probably be adequate. Because right now we have to play in such a way that we always serve the same side of the court, and that's not the way tennis. We want to be able to serve the side. Okay. Uh, who else like? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Marsha Miller. Um, I know that many, many people attend a concert on the green that is fabulous, and I think that the um, children um, are there, the parents come, and those kids just play in that sand trap that's there now. I'm not sure that the sand trap is there. I think it's a great thing for parents to be able to be there and enjoy themselves and have the children enjoy themselves too. And um, we were there last two weeks ago with 100 degrees and the trees. I mean, most people weren't bothered by 100 degrees just because of the way that shaded most people who could sit, at least if you got there early enough. So I'm, I'm hoping there's enough room there for the band, for children, um, for the jumpy house, for all that, because it is a um, family affair. Let's take a quick break here and go back to Terry. Uh, Terry, I don't think you really quite explained how that uh, outdoor event area might function. That might, that might help with some of those questions. I did a little bit, and um, you know, we were, the idea was is, um, if, you're, if you're sitting here, Actually, when we design amphitheaters, typically what we do is face the stage to the south and face the viewers a little more so that the people watching a band or watching a performance is not looking into the sun. And definitely you don't want to be looking west. That's a real problem. But right here, the thought was, is and we kind of drew this blob on here, but it's, the idea would be all the seating would be kind of in this location looking north to what we're going to double, um, this current deck is going to double as a stage. It's got power there. People, the performers or whoever's there can use the, this room here to get prepared, whatever they're doing. Um, but the idea would be to, to maintain this large lawn area. I, I can't tell you exactly how many seats of people will bring blankets there, but we're not really dishing it out. It's not an amphitheater per se, but it's a, it's a like an event lawn where you can put tables and chairs and um, stage community events. And we also had a discussion about the barbecue area that's right here on whether that should be maintained exactly the way it is or do we want to do something a little more horrible and bring a barbecue, have a community own its own barbecue on wheels coming here for people to use or events to use. That way we have a little more flexibility in how we use this whole space, how we want to set it up, because it could be different depending on the type of event. So, so the idea there would be maximum flexibility is what they're trying to think of there for that, that space. So the functions that we have there now can be programmed in the same space is, is the concept. Okay, Louis microphone now. You guys have had, you got both the microphones on this side. Okay, let's go into the back there. I have a question regarding the same area. Um, 
the weddings, we have weddings that have been held up in, in this building prior to taking out the food and beverage up here. So if we do weddings out there, is, is this going to be done in that lawn area that you're talking about? Or will they be more outdoor? And how have you figured in how to keep the golf part of it um, away from that during the ceremony? They, that Foxtail does it in a certain way where people are not allowed to use the putting green during the period of the ceremony and they just walk them out for a period of time. So I want to know what considerations have been taken. Yeah, that. That, that's a great question. It's it's always seems to be a conflict between the golf and somebody who's renting that room. But the way this has been laid out, absolutely. This can, we can, spend a little more time here on designing a space to where if someone wants to have a wedding um, there would be a, a, a definite location where where um, the, how the chairs would be set up in, in the in, in at the time of the event the other thing that we talked about and we're not showing it here we, we're kind of going back and forth on it is there's an opportunity to bring a separate entry for uh, reception in this space, be able to shut these doors off, and there's a door right here now. So there's a there's an opportunity for maybe the parking lot to bring a pathway into this entry, so that people that are coming here for the wedding could come in and not bother what's going on with the rest of the facility, whether it be golf or your dining room or your bar or whatever. Keep it totally separate. They, they do. I mean, we can make quite a bit of money, I believe. But people that couldn't hear, she was talking about there. There is a economic it's definitely a revenue generator. Revenue yeah. generation from large. If the facility is set correctly, it can be. You, you still have to have a, a place for the bride and groom to prepare. Come out. <coughs> I'm just, I'm just asking because up here, it's set up here. Everybody's out here. So if we were going to use that facility for that same purpose at certain times, we could generate income from that. But it needs to be set. Uh, good, good idea. Uh, Patrick, I believe you have a wife. Yeah, Patrick, she need Terry, a question. If you get the go, how long does it take to get these two go done? <laughs> um, <laughs> typical construction for something like this, right, what, 11 to 12 months? Probably the underground breaks in 12 to 15 months. Um, but uh, that's as much as I can tell you as far as when we get to go ahead. Um, you know, we're in a very conceptual stage right now. There's a lot of work to be done between now and breaking ground as far as more decisions, financing, number of things. But just I know that construction itself is roughly in that 12 month, maybe 13 month range. Now you know why I think for young people. Because by the time it gets approved, the time it gets built, like Adele says, I hope I'm still here. <laughs> okay, that's the microphone. So practical and typical. Um, there is cost associated to it, but operationally, it works much better for golf operations. Visit the carts won't be visible. You will not know they're down there from the parking lot or the entry of the building. Um, the only place you'll know that they'll be visible is in the back here, in the back where there's a ramp coming from below up here into a cart staging area that's in this location. Um, we also would widen the cart pass to be able to do shotgun starts and that kind of thing for, for golf. But, but there is a cost associated to it. Um, what it does is it frees up uh, lots of opportunity by having the carts down below. It gives us where the current facilities out here allows us to move this driving range over. Um, there's a number of things it allows us to do where we haven't, it's, there's definitely um, in our budget analysis, We'll probably look at a solution where we have an external building that houses all the carts. Just as a, you know, where can it go? What, what's the difference in the cost? And 
what is the sacrifice operationally? So that's still part of the analysis. Karen Wade, I had an idea about the wedding that that west facing deck, how many people could you put, how many chairs could you put there? And um, then you could have the bride and groom over by the oak tree. I don't know if that would work. Right now, um, internally, we're showing uh, 96. If we were to close this up, no, allow for the rest of this to continue. No, I'm talking office. about the outside yeah, deck. Yeah, I'm going to help you there. Okay. Um, there's 96 here, so extending that deck my, my anticipation would be to get another 48 outside on that deck. So wedding size, maybe about 140 to 150 total when inside and out together. Um, I'm not sure what the demand's been. You know, there's some opportunities to extend the deck out further. It just depends on what makes the most sense for the demand and the budget, absolutely. Budget's always there. Uh, Mike? Uh, Mike Brandon. Uh, uh, two quick ones. Uh, first of all, on that floor plan, how much of the, how far would the uh, underground cart storage facility extend? Where would that lie on that floor plan? Can you show well, us? Right now, this footprint is about 13,500 square feet. Is that right? And the cart storage is about 6,200 square feet, roughly. So, roughly, it would occupy half, half. about this half here. Okay, thank you. And my other question is uh, the 164 parking stalls, how does that tally with our negotiations with the county on parking? I can, I can answer that one, Mike, because staff didn't want to work on this in 2011, uh, looking at the parking requirements, and we were coming up consistently with numbers in the 130 to 150 range, so we're a little bit beyond that at this point. But they've added some assembly rooms, and so that changes the count. So one of the things when um, Terry and uh, Greg sit down with the building officials of Lake County, with the, uh, once we get an idea of what we want to do, that's the point where they will sit down and start negotiating all the parking, uh, handicap accessibility issues at that point. But it's in the ballpark. It's in the ballpark of all we need. And just a point of clarification on the wedding question. Um, you know, with the, the ceremony, I think that what we meant was the ceremonies are usually held outside and then the party and everything else goes inside. The, the inside plan is perfect because that's a lot of room, a lot of flexibility. However, for a wedding ceremony to be sheltered from the regular golf activities would be a good selling point of how you set it up in number five in that, in that grassy stage area. So if it could be sheltered for the wedding ceremonies, from the rest of the building. And then my final question is, has the board set a budget? Uh, how much would this cost? Is there a limit that you're looking at? Uh, what, have the, what have the developers now given as far as the budget? Well, yeah, we kind of want to be in seven digits, not eight. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion about that is going to start this afternoon with the next agenda item. Um, at some point, the board is going to need to start looking at square footage. What are the options for the potential things that might be added to the project? Good example, like Terry said, should we have an external building for cart storage versus an underground building? Well, you take a look at the cost differential and decide how much important is it to have an underground versus. So the, all those trade-off questions, the board is going to start working on, and there's a, I have this many that you've already given me relative to questions like that. Um, I haven't talked to the board about this, but let me throw this out, board members. Um, we are going to want to present the detailed cost estimates that have already been done for these schemes to the board. Uh, in a way that they have time to take a look at that. It's extremely detailed information. But we also want the community involved when the board starts talking about those trade-offs. And should we 
do something different here, a different total approach, like a new building versus a remodel, um, should we decide that nothing happens at this building relative to food and beverage service and it becomes all recreational or fitness and the other building is where all those things. I mean, those are the basic decisions the board has to make. It affects square footage, it affects cost. So that dialogue's gonna to start today. Uh, we've had numerous people here say, why don't you have the board meeting that's scheduled for the 25th here? Uh, because you're probably gonna have a lot of people interested in seeing those cost figures. So I, I talked to a couple of board members and they say that's an excellent idea. We will in fact do that. But we still have a board meeting in the evening at 6.30, which is somewhat difficult for some of our folks to attend. So I'm believing we're gonna have another forum. Uh, we'll talk to the board about it and get the dates. But we'll have another time to continue this conversation. Uh, because what we're talking about today is really uh, design options. You can do this, you can do that. What do you want to do? But the what are you going to do answer is what the board has to do, and they're going to need continual input from the community on those questions. So that's where we were talking about in the break, uh, maybe doing another form like this. Staying at the conceptual level uh, before we cut these guys loose to start more detailed uh, design. So that's what we're kind of thinking now. We'll put out an email blast, let you know how we might be able to schedule that after I have a chance to talk to board members. We've got one more question over here. Oh, behind the pillar. Yeah, I'm okay, behind you, Jewelville. Uh, Jack Worcester uh, was part of the design criteria of storage for personal cards. Is, is there now, or is that part of the thought process? It isn't part of the design. And yeah, number 17 on there. There's a separate one right there. Oh, okay. I didn't get, excuse me, I didn't get that <laughs> presentation. I apologize. Why? Okay, anybody else have questions at this point? I have three questions. One, um, the, I'm oh, sorry, this is better. Okay. The area leading from the parking area looks like a drop off site here with a circle in the middle. What's what's in the middle? Uh, yeah. and that's where the bronze statue of Wayne Park goes. <laughs> That's a great question and one the board is going to have to take a look at because the concept of this is that it become a uh, community center and, and uh, utilized by the entire community. You know, this facility already has uh, a lot of uses on it that are not golf related and that's the intention of the board. So how they do that is how they set their policies of uh, access to the building. Is there going to be preferential scheduling? Is there going to be uh, discounts or free utilization somewhere where we have the activity center? Um, great questions, again, and the board's going to be waiting through all those things. Yeah. Susan. Yeah, mine's easy. The current facility, 13,000 square feet um, here, or should I say, what is our current facility size? Yeah, something to compare this to. It's, it's about 8,000 square feet. Eight. I'd like to just make a comment in regards to the use of this building. Um, even if we take out the commercial kitchen, I know there are a lot of groups that because of the fabulous views of the lake and the golf course and the mountains, they would prefer to have their event here. Would it be possible for them to rent this space and have the food catered up from the other kitchen? The prices, right? uh, that, that's a question that board is going to have to wrestle with. Uh, uh, currently, we do that about two dozen times a year. Um, we don't make any money. Uh, it's very problematical uh, to staff events. At the same time, you're running a seven-day-a-week uh, restaurant, uh, three meals a day restaurant. Uh, for two dozen events a year, it's pretty hard to have people uh, hanging around just waiting to work. Those, Two dozen events, so there are a lot of issues there. Uh, so uh, the board's going to have to wade through that. 
And I think Sandy really hit it. You know, are we going to have the traditional use of this building uh, because of its location and that? Or are we going to abandon that use and have all those kinds of events happen at the new facility? Big question, has a lot of cost implications. One of the things the board's going to be really struggling with, I, I believe. I think that's a, uh, one of their main issues they've got to decide there. Yeah, uh, just one thing on the private cart barn. I don't know if it's sort of an afterthought, but can you explain why it's located where it is relative to the cart staging area? It seems awesome to bring and right next to the tennis court. You mean people don't bring carts to play tennis? <laughs> okay, uh, the question uh, had to do with uh, private cards. Uh, wait, can you explain why we even have private cards? I mean, I asked that question myself. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we have 22 stalls right now that generate some revenue from the storage of that. Uh, there's a lot of people in this community that have their golf carts but live way up the hill and it's not feasible to keep driving up and down from Raven Hill or Eagle Rock and all that. So we've had a lot of demand for that space. You know, the location, yeah, it's not really close to the, the um, to the where the, the building is, but it's close to the parking. And I think they were just, that was just the first option. That was kind of our last thing in yesterday's meeting was kind of figuring out where to put that. And it's a small requirement of space once we take that away from where our current car barn is. Um, and, and most people that would be using their private car would be parking probably over that side, grab their car and go up to the clubhouse. Yeah, we, we've looked at this look over here as well, so that's something that probably needs further what study. About across the street. So the concept, uh, Bill, I believe, is that um, the people that park their private cars there don't necessarily need to be close to the building. They can come in in their vehicles, get in their cart, and go to the building if they're going to be playing golf that day. Uh, so, in, in our, our community was not designed for golf carts. So, as you know, it's very difficult to move them around in our road system, and especially with the hilly nature of our community, which originally I was lobbying to get rid of this private car thing. You know, why do we do this? This is crazy. But it really does serve a function for many members uh, to be able to come down and play golf without having to drive their car all the way down from 10 at 9. So, uh, the idea was to have it someplace where it would uh, not impact that much on the other facility. Wayne is of the opinion that we really do not want to have a mixture of uh, the golf cart fleet owned by the association and private carts like the current have. It creates a lot of management issues. Okay? Where's the microphone? Oh, right here. Will, Deborah Vera, will the current or the proposed design encroach upon the wide walking and bicycle path uh, that runs alongside Hartman Road. Yeah. For the school kids to ride and walk their bikes, or rather walk and ride their bikes to school. Yeah, we would not want to do that. We, we would not want to interrupt any kind of flow we have along the street currently. We're right now, we don't, we're working off of a Google image. And so what we have is, we're, you know, all the, everything that's going along the frontage here, well, it'll be maintained in its final design look. Where's your other mic? In front. Right here, Ken. Hi, uh, Ken Harbison. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, thank you guys for this great concept. Um, and, and I know there's some folks here that uh, aren't in favor of this, and there always are, there always will be, um, as well as the golf course. But I, I'm just glad that I'm here uh, and not in Clear Lake, where there's another lake. Um, <laughs> And, but there's no golf course in Berlin. So anyway, my question is, um, on, the, on the golf restaurant facility, how much higher in elevation will that be than the current one? That's a great question for all kinds of reasons. Um, right now we're thinking, uh, we, I don't know the exact elevation of the current one, but the idea would be to have this whole floor, these four feet above the grade in order to accommodate a cart barn raised up and then get some ventilation around the, up the base of the building to ventilate that cart barn out. So it's going to be at least four feet above the pond, maybe a little more than that. I, so I'm so can't talking about elevation. six feet because the current uh, building is about two feet below the grade, if I remember correctly. So what happens it's is you get this you get this better view orientation of the course. 
what happens when that thing goes up. Thank you. Other way? Anybody else? No, you have I know she had a one. Well, right now we're just we're showing a, a table of it's four hundred and fifty square feet. So you know right now that table is a uh, size for uh, 12 people. Um, it could be bigger. We could, we could shape the table differently. We can make the table so that it's flexible and it could be split in half and part of it can be stored away. Um, we want to approach that small space just like everywhere else where there's lots of flexibility that we haven't gone into a lot of detail on exactly identifying all the different types of uh, people that would be using that space. Rose, the concept there was uh, we have a lot of small groups like a, a board of a club or something like that, and they're meeting in the Greenview room because they want a private room. They don't want to be out in the middle of the restaurant. So when you saw my graph, you saw that's somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the use of the Greenview room is groups that would be able to fit in this room. So the concept is why tie up one of these rooms when you could have them there? And that, that's that's the concept. The answer the underlying question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, one more. One more, Mike. I think we need to go to the next part of the agenda. We're kind of running out of questions here. Karen, you get the wrap it. Okay. The uh, private storage for golf carts, can uh, can that be uh, across the street in that overflow parking area? Is that a possibility? It would be very no, I know it's long term. The answer is yes. Uh, the the uh, other question, do we want to do that? Increase more That's traffic back you know, across Hartman Road, which, which has safety issues, but uh, it's certainly cool. If we want to have space for something else. Yeah. Bob, uh, any board members have any questions at this stage where you want to talk about these conceptual designs? Because I didn't give you an opportunity to like to have a question. Uh, okay, real, real quickly, if the if the uh, if, if the main floor of the building is positioned four feet above grade, does that mean that the that the floor of the lower level will be six feet below grade? And what are the implications of that with the water table? I don't know exactly where your water table is. The answer to your question is is, is I think we're going to be more like probably more like 11 feet floor to floor. So that means if we're four feet above or seven feet below. Um, there's a number of things you can do uh, down there to deal with water table issues. Um, it does add cost in the waterproofing. Um, the good thing is, is it's not a conditioned space and it's not a space where, where people are um, uh, people are working there, but there's not like an indoor space where, where we don't have, there's just a lot of concrete down there that would not rot away and that kind of thing. So, wanna, yeah, just to clarify, there's some other functions down below, such as cart storage, we've got uh, seasonal storage, and things that we didn't want to take uh, the important floor area of the main floor of the building to do. Um, there's also uh, programs and wash facilities for towels or uh, golf staff, um, possibly beer cake store. We've got a good 55 degree climate down in the basement, so we can use that rather than again uh, bar storage area, bar area, floor area, we can use those down below to, to really get some benefit out of that structure as well as the, the card market. Okay, um, I want to wrap this piece up, Carolyn. Uh, just, quickly. No, I just I have a process question. Now one o'clock, and we haven't even gotten number five. That's correct. On the agenda, and I think there's a lot of members that are very interested in being here to participate and, and listen to the board discussion and participate in that. But a lot of them have left because they anticipated that this morning. They've made other commitments. So can we reschedule that? Well, um, <coughs> let's think. Let's think that over. Um, 
what, what Carolyn is talking about is uh, it's one o'clock, which of course I had noticed. What an attractive clock. Was that the volunteers? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, she's saying, okay, maybe we need to rethink a little bit of where we're going because this next item on the agenda, uh, the board of directors discussion, which is going to be talking about some of our financing options, do we want to do X, Y, or Z, is going to be very um, involved discussion. It's going to take quite a bit of time. We probably don't want to sit around here until 3 o'clock this afternoon. And as Carolyn pointed out, a lot of people were already left, probably 40, 50% of the audience. We already talked about the idea of the um, uh, board on the 2015, their first look at the orders of magnitude construction costs for all the different options and also, also the, uh, the, the things like the golf cart stories and all these other things that we start putting that together. Uh, we also talked about maybe having another forum like this to maybe bring those cost numbers, some of the options back together, talk about do we want to consider some other things that we haven't currently done. The bit, another benefit is if we go with that concept is that that will give our pool consultants uh, time to finish up their evaluation of our existing pool so the board would have that piece of information as well. The other thing we're doing is we're using the uh, construction company that Williams and Patton are using to do um, updates of the costs related to uh, continuing to own these buildings. All those costs that were squirreled away in the reserve study uh, never got updated in 2010. Uh, we're updating the reserve study now. We could use better, more accurate costs so the board knows what it will it cost if we want to continue operating one of these buildings the way we are now into the future. So that piece of information would also be available. So board members, what do you think? Should we punt and build another forum around your discussion of all these conceptual options, uh, the cost figures, and uh, give more people a little bit of opportunity to do that? I think some people are going to be fading quickly uh, from lack of uh, food, if nothing else. So Mr. Wade, what's your thought? My thought is I'm hungry. <laughs> My thought is I'm hungry. Uh, actually, uh, had pet problems this morning and had to rush uh, rush around. So uh, that's a, as far as I'm concerned, that's fine with me to because I would rather be more informed with the finances and everything as well uh, before we get into much of a discussion. What about the rest? I got the microphone, so I'm talking. Um, the only concern I have is with rescheduling, and I, I do appreciate all the people who have stayed here, and, and um, my thought is is that we all have plans as well, and, and scheduling more meetings means scheduling or rescheduling plans that we may have made or not being able to participate because depending on when the, the new meeting or new forum or whatever is scheduled added on to an already pretty uh, pretty crowded list. Um, what I do want to make sure of is that we at least get overtime paid for uh, any additional meetings, um, at least time and a half of what we're getting now. But that is, scheduling is always a problem. I mean, we're missing one board member today uh, who may have had it, but, but I mean, other meetings, we may be missing other board members, and I think it's important for all of us to be able to participate in these, in these discussions. You done? Are you done? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would be for it that we definitely rescheduled and have another forum because we don't have a lot, a lot of information yet that we have to make decisions on. And if I look at my notes, every third sentence from the bill chairman to the, was that the board needs to make more decisions. So every third sentence of what the board needs to make more decisions. And I think, yes, we do. But we also need time to look at everything, make an intelligent decision, and then can come back and tell the people what we like to do and how we see the whole picture. Thank you. Um, since you haven't given us any financial numbers, um, it's anything that we do today to talk about you know what, how we're going to handle this thing is going to be purely conceptual 
And until we get some concrete numbers, um, we're just kind of spinning our wheels and, and playing a lot of what F games. And, and, and yeah, I'm hungry too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do. I think that uh, just to follow up on that, the board does not have any information as to the financial responsibility, whether short term or long term. And until we get more of that information, I don't feel that we can have a discussion at this time because we don't have any knowledge to discuss it with. Okay, we have consensus, I believe, that uh, if we could make the schedule work, uh, Mike, are you were shaking your head then? Yeah, I was just going to add that, that reluctantly I agree with the other board members. I, I think many people were at yeah. <laughs> To be astonished that the rest of the board members. Uh, but uh, I think this is such an important matter that our time would be better spent with more information available to all. And as a start, I suggest that everybody read the handout here because it has a good introductory discussion of what the options are. And the more people can inform themselves about this, the better off we all will be when we face these decisions. Okay. Uh, I, I think we have consensus here. And Caroline, thank you very much for uh, suggesting that because quite frankly, I didn't see how we were going to do it. Um, but uh, we have uh, a number of questions, uh, five questions on that screen sheet that was given to some people. I have 24 R's that are asking questions, and I've held those back because they really didn't relate to design issues. They related more to trying to uh, 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 ask questions of the board, how are you going to approach this next step? And so those will all be uh, given to the board prior to the next meeting. I'll, I'll type these all up. and. Uh, they can look at them in advance and be prepared to respond to all those questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions for additional information. We'll get that ready for the next meeting. We, of course, will have the uh, order of magnitude cost available. Um, yeah, okay, I think we're ready. And I, I want to personally thank you all. I love this meeting. It was fun. I really did. Thank you. like to see a community do, get together and talk something over and do it in a civil manner. I appreciate it. If you have any questions, anything you want to get to the board, please email us. Anything that, you know, that's what we have in mind. Thank you.